So thanks, uh, Moshe, for an inspiring talk. And I'll also talk about knowledge in the distributed systems and uh, in a more strict uh, sense. Um, it's, it's really wonderful to be here to see, I mean, <clears throat> in this uh, happy event honoring Joe and to see all the wonderful familiar faces. Um, <clears throat> so my talk will have uh, two parts. The first part will be nostalgia, nostalgia talking about history, repeating some of uh, <coughs> the history you already heard. Um, but it'll be more about you know, my, or how I met our father and uh, how we got to work on knowledge. Uh, so there'll be some interesting or some new observations. It'll be a bias, you know, my, my subjective uh, view of this. And then I'll have a slightly more technical uh, discussion about uh, knowledge action and what's in between, how they're related. And basically, my view after a few years of working on the topic on the connection between knowledge and action. So we've already heard that Joe, having uh, completed his, B, <coughs> his bachelor's degree in Toronto in math, already became head of the math department only 30 years later became head of computer science. But this was in uh, Bakugana, uh, in Bakugana, and this was a picture I found. I don't know if it was already there at the time, or maybe then it looked different, but. Okay, so, so the point is that at there, Joe was solving puzzles, teaching math, but there's no evidence that he was doing logic. <coughs> Coming to, to his PhD, as Eva mentioned, uh, he started working with Albert and started working on knowledge and works on modal logic related things. His first uh, papers started in 1981 when he also got his thesis. And this is, uh, I tried to get period the pictures, not all uh, <coughs> quite relevant, but this is uh, Harvard math and Google <coughs> from there. Uh, he went on to do his postdoc at MIT. This is uh, MIT Tech Square. Uh, and he publishes his first uh, highly cited, close to a thousand citations, and not, not for Joe, highly cited for most of us, uh, paper with Alan Emerson on uh, temporal logic, very influential in formal methods. Uh, and then he moved to IBM Almaden. I couldn't get <coughs> the buildings from then, so this is the, the new version of the buildings. And um, and he comes to Stanford uh, to give a seminar on logics of programs. I was a student at the time. I attended that. I was looking for an advisor. Joe was looking for a student, and so. That's when I met your father, and we decided to, he agreed, or we agreed tentatively on advising, and we also decided to work on logics of knowledge and belief. So we're now celebrating, this event is actually for me, celebration of our 40th anniversary of meeting Joe. And <clears throat> I want to talk about a little bit about how or why we came to work on knowledge and belief. And before I do that, I'll mention a few things, partly overlapping Moshe's, about the history of the modern era of epistemic logics and modal logics. So really, uh, the modern era starts, I think, with uh, Saul Kripke's uh, work which he initiated in high school, of course. Uh, he had several, I think, three very seminal uh, papers, first published when he was already 19. Um, 
<clears throat> on Kripke structures, Kripke frames, and you know, his work really guides uh, much of what we do, or is that the basis of a lot of what we do in uh, modal logics <clears throat> and formal methods, and also in epistemic logic. Hintika in 1962 uh, <clears throat> actually published Knowledge and Belief, which was a book on knowledge and belief, and this was already based on or incorporated Kripke's uh, work. You've already heard about uh, David Lewis' foundational uh, book convention where he introduced common knowledge. And then for applications, Alman in 76 had agreeing to disagree, which again you've heard about. Um, and he initiated the work on applications of knowledge in economics, which was quite uh, influential. And at the, <coughs> roughly the same time, John McCarthy started to look at formal math, formal logics of uh, knowledge in AI. McCarthy also coined the term AI. Um, and so that's, that's free history as far as we are concerned. Now, the <clears throat> question is, why should we study knowledge and belief? Well, uh, Von Pratt introduced uh, dynamic logic, I guess, in a paragraph at the end of some paper in the mid-70s. And Bob Moore, who was a student of McCarthy's, uh, an MIT student of McCarthy's at Stanford, and was working on reasoning about knowledge and action, he pointed out that, hey, all these dynamic logics are just a modal, a regular modal logic with lots of operators. And so when I spoke with uh, Joe, he said, well, we know, we've been, we, that is Joe and colleagues, by that time probably 10 papers uh, in 83, uh, about <coughs> all this uh, work on complexity uh, and, and expressibility and whatever of uh, temporal logics, dynamic logics, uh, process logics, likelihood, whatever. Uh, and we know now that it's, it's all modal logic and we can apply the same techniques that we've been applying, that he's been applying, we can apply the same techniques he's been applying <coughs> from logic of programs to knowledge and belief. So that was the beginning. In fact, that's what I started working on on my thesis. And it ended up being a paper published a little later. Basically, analyzing the logics of knowledge and belief, the, axi the axioms Moshe was talking about, etc. So <coughs> that's all nice. But in the summer at Almaden, Danny Dolev, uh, came to visit. He, he had finished his postdoc, he was faculty in Jerusalem, and he was coming in the summers. And he told us about the talk he heard from Alman about uh, the, the cheating wives puzzle, probably what sprouted uh, Danny Lehman's uh, paper as well. But then he came with something that really changed the course, I think, of my research and of many aspects <coughs> from here on. He said, well, this is a puzzle you'll hear about it in the next talk, uh, <coughs> in which there's an announcement. But what happens is, instead of an announcement, the agents communicate over a network with all sorts of properties. How do things change? So this was the first place where the question was, how does knowledge change in a distributed system? How does that matter? How does that affect the outcome? And this turned out to be a paper that I like to call the chaos paper because it was cheating husbands and other stories. <coughs> a fun paper if anyone wants to read it. It's my one fun paper. <coughs> in any case, so that was started in 83, published a little later. Now to complete the historical, my historical survey. Well, in 84, our first paper that uh, Moshe uh, mentioned was luckily rejected from stock 
and accepted the Patsy. If it had been accepted the Fox, we'd have a smaller, you know, half this audience, and it would be doomed for oblivion. Went to Patsy, and it got recognition, and people were interested. In 85, Joe initiated, but Moshe and Ron were very <coughs> heavily involved, a knowledge seminar at IBM, which created a real buzz. And in 86, Joe founded, organized the first TARC conference at Asilomar. This is uh, Asilomar, wonderful place. TARC has been going on for 37 years. TARC was <coughs> the uh, theoretical aspects of reasoning about knowledge. Later, uh, demoted into reasoning about rationality of knowledge and knowledge, which really made it a less uh, attractive conference for me. But anyway, um, <clears throat> and also in 86, we started working on the book that, that uh, Moshe uh, mentioned, and we swiftly finished it in 95, like only nine years later. But you saw the picture of the book. Okay. So, <clears throat> why, why is uh, knowledge really essential for distributed computing? Well, we used to say things like the following, in, in justifying why knowledge is relevant. We would say, well, you know, anyone who writes a, a mail protocol or whatever ends up talking about knowledge all the time. And we want to formalize it. We want to give the foundations. Okay, acknowledgments and all that. Well, another thing is, well, you know, every process, every individual in the service system has only a partial view of the world, and they need to act based on global knowledge. Okay, and another thing, which I guess one of the slogans in my thesis was, you can think of the communication as the act of changing the system state of knowledge. And finally... Another quote I found, I think, in, in our paper with Joe, was that protocols must ensure that agents have the necessary knowledge to act correctly. Something to that effect. So all of these things are true. I believe them. But, you know, especially something like the last statement is something that Joe, as an advisor, would tell you, okay, fine. Protocols must ensure that agents... But, Yoram, what does that mean? Okay? I mean, you say something, it's kind of sensible, but, you know, you can't go to the market with that. Just prove, show me something. And this was all we kind of used to say, or is, as far as I uh, remember it. Now, what I want to do with the next, however many minutes I have, is uh, to give a more precise meaning to give a formal connection between knowledge and action that would justify this and as more than just uh, like background speech. So <clears throat> I'll talk about specifications of uh, distributed protocol. And so in general, in distributed <coughs> problems, actions can depend on information all across the system. I mean, <coughs> Moshe was, uh, was pointing that out. So, for example, you know, you should only commit a transaction if none of the participants votes to abort it. That would be a transaction commit protocol, one of the constraints. An autonomous car may be allowed to cross the intersection only if there's no uh, cross or enter the intersection if there's no cross traffic. Let me put all these down because uh, in uh, a consensus problem, if Adam decides zero, I shouldn't decide one. Okay? Um, so, you know, if something happens somewhere else, that affects what I should do here. Garbage collection. You shouldn't erase a data item if someone is going to need it later. Okay? Or a mutual exclusion. Not allowed to enter the critical section if someone else is in the critical section. So my actions really depend on things that happen everywhere. But notice that none of these says anything about knowledge. I mean, you kind of need knowledge in order to do them, but formally, 
knowledge doesn't appear in it here, and typically in specifications, knowledge does not appear. Okay, unless you're doing privacy. Or, you know. <clears throat> okay, so how can we formalize a connection? Well, I want to uh, define the notion of a necessary condition. We say that some fact on property phi is a necessary condition for performing an action alpha if phi has to be <coughs> true whenever alpha is performed, or alpha is never performed if phi is false. Okay, so in fact, specifications impose necessary condition. All these conditions that I said were that a necessary condition for committing is that no one voted to abort. A necessary condition for deleting an item is that no one will need it in the future, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Each one of these was a necessary condition. Okay, that should be hopefully not uh, be too controversial. And this should be true in a system R, which means a system for me is all the runs of the protocol you're designing. So in all executions, you know, you should never enter the critical section if I'm there. Okay. So now, here's a theorem, which I guess I wrote down in PAC 2015. It basically says that if phi is a necessary condition for performing alpha, then knowing phi is a necessary condition for performing alpha. And that should be quite simple. The proof is like a two line, sometimes five, depending on the system you're talking about, but a very simple proof. If I, <coughs> if I enter the critical section without knowing that it's empty, that means there's another execution where I have the same information and Mark is in the critical section with the same information. I perform the same action and I step into the critical section, which is not empty. So that, that's essentially the proof. It's a trivial, it's an obvious statement. Okay? But one interesting thing about this theorem is that it applies broadly to all models of distributed computing. Distributed computing, as opposed to sequential computing, does not have a Unify Turing machine model or whatever. There are lots of lots of models, and there are very few theorems that apply across all models. And this one is one that does. But one of the implications of this is that, again, looking at all of these properties that I mentioned before, now you can only commit if you know that no one voted to abort. You can only Decide zero if you know that no one has decided one, et cetera, et cetera. Which means that all of these specifications that did not mention knowledge, they were actually requirements that you know certain things when you act. They didn't say that. Even the people who specified not having taken our courses don't know that this is what they're saying. But anyone implementing will have to satisfy these knowledge requirements in order to get a correct solution. Okay? So this shows, this draws a fundamental connection between knowledge and action, and it shows why knowledge is so central to distributed uh, behavior. Now, um, <clears throat> of course, there's a question of how can you know various things? How do you basically know something in a distributed system? Well, you know, you can get a message saying that. Or it might be an indirect message. Someone told Joe, Joe told me, and now I know that that someone, you know, was in favor of aborting. Or uh, maybe uh, I know something because someone didn't tell me that it wasn't true. So there are various ways of knowing things. And so that's why. That's why distributed computing can be subtle and complicated. So how much time do I have? <laughs> 10 minutes. OK, so I'll. OK, so I'll, I'll, I'll use the next. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe Q&A up to this point, so I know how much I. So any comments at this point? Usually, you, you, I mean, some of you know, but where I come from, this is too quiet. 
So you're, you're all polite, and that's why it's it's it's, it's proper. But you know, at least Moshe was saying. So any any comments, questions? Uh, yes, question. sure. I'm not from school. I actually work in physics, so thinking about distributed in, in physics, knowledge has a speed, the speed of light, mm -hmm. and anything you can't make a decision until an event happens here, and you're sitting up there. You can't make a decision. You can't know for sure that this thing happened until you know it's going to be causal. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure it's it just seems to be also got some finite extent, and I haven't heard you talk about time delay. It, how do you know that there's something in the intersection? Unless you've had the time to query it to get an answer back. So it seems to me not a fine detail, it's a technical detail, but sort of fundamental to making decisions in distributed systems, kind of the propagation, propagation time of knowledge. So how does that work in? Okay, so it's very important, it's crucial. I'll, I'll have a, you know, a slight connection in my example, and I'd love to talk to you afterwards because, in fact, the work on knowledge uh, has led to. Uh, theories of timing for circuits and things like that, things that are very close to physics. So really, let's get back. So, so yeah, I mean, if there's not enough time for information to reach me, then I might not know whether something has happened or not or how it happened. So anyway, <clears throat> uh, okay. So I'll look at an example. Uh, atomic commitment is a well-known uh, problem in database theory. And the whole idea is we were performing some transaction. Now we have to decide whether we're going to commit it or not. So you have n agents, each with a vote, initial state vj, the vote of j. And it's 1 if I'm in favor of committing, and it's 0 if I, uh, I, th I know there's a problem and uh, we shouldn't be committing. So <clears throat> a protocol should satisfy the following uh, properties. Every process, every process <coughs> should eventually commit or abort. Uh, all the processes should make the same decision. And uh, <coughs> you should only commit if all votes were one. If anyone voted zero, you should not. Now, this should work in a system in which processes can also crash. And that's why it says every correct process, every process that does not uh, fail, does not crash, should, uh, should decide, and all the ones that survive to the decision make the same decision, and uh, you should abort only if someone was, <coughs> you know, I mean, if, if, if all votes are won and no one fails, you have to commit. So a uh, necessary condition for aborting is, is this, okay? So by knowledge of preconditions, a necessary condition for committing is knowing that everyone's vote voted in favor. Okay? That makes sense? And we can use knowledge of preconditions to get um, a necessary condition, additional necessary conditions for committing and aborting. That's all true, but I'm going to, uh, I want to, oops, sorry, focus just on, on uh, analyzing this. So how can you know uh, the value of an initial, you know, initial value? OK? So it turns out that in an asynchronous system, in a system where there's no bound on how long messages can take, then the only way you can know that my vote was one is if there's a message chain from me that reaches you. So you know my vote is one only if there's a message chain for me to you. You don't know if there isn't. And this it sort of relates to uh, you know time space diagram. Okay, but without the bound on time. Okay, now suppose you have a bound on time. So suppose uh, <coughs> messages take exactly one step to be delivered among you know, a longer channel. Then uh, well, then you can pass information by not sending a message. And if I don't send you a message at time t, at time t plus one, you'll say, ah, your arm didn't send me a message, so maybe he's telling me something. Okay? So Lamport 
discuss this, call these null messages. And in fact, in such systems where you have a bound on how long messages take, then uh, the only way you can know that my value was one is if there's a message chain, but now we allow null messages as uh, allowed messages here. Okay? Okay, so last four or five, four minutes <coughs> is I want to talk about what happens if we have synchronous communication, but processes can crash. Well, in that case, a null message can be confused with a crash. You don't hear from me at time t plus one, Rafael, but you say, well, maybe your arm is flaky. Maybe he really didn't want to send me a message and want to tell me about it. So the question is, can we uh, transmit information in silence when you have, where you're synchronous and you have a crash failures? Well, without crash failures, my silence gives you information. But if there can be a failure and I'm silent to you, you can tell if this was because I was silent or because I crashed. So it turns out that <clears throat> here's a way in which we can pass information in silence if uh, there's a bound on how many failures there can be. So we're designing a, a program that should uh, say, overcome up to 10 failures. So <clears throat> I want to tell you that my value is one. What I do is I find F plus one friends. I tell them, hey, I send the messages saying my value is one. And then in the next round, they are all silent to you. Now you can tell these are F plus one guys. If most F of them are faulty, one of them is being silent on purpose. So you actually learn that my value is one. So I don't have to send you a message. I don't have to create a message chain to you. And I've saved a lot because I spent F plus one messages and saved my message to you. Uh, well, is that a saving? Well, it can be a saving because they can also be silent to lots of others. And then we save a lot of messages. Okay, so this is, we call this a silent choir. What's interesting is that we can prove that <coughs> for you to know that my value was one, either there has to be a message chain from me to you, a real message chain, or there has to be a silent choir used from me to you. Those are the only two ways in which you can learn my initial value. Okay? So now let's go back to atomic commitment. <coughs> we had this specification. And remember, one of the things we need, okay, one of the things we need is uh, for you to know that everyone voted to commit in order for you to commit. So uh, <coughs> we're interested in efficient protocols in cases where no failures happen. So we call a nice run is a run in which everyone is in favor and no one fails. And here's a protocol, a well-known protocol that solved atomic commitment efficiently in an optimal number of messages uh, for that case by Garawi and, and Wang in Pods 19, uh, 2017. Basically, they arranged the processes in a circle, and they send just in every round, they send a message from one to two and so on up to n minus one. Another f messages they send uh, <coughs> in after that, and then uh, they wait n plus f rounds, and if there was no, no one uh, complained then they commit. So this uses a very small number of messages and works nicely. Turns out that there's kind of a silent choir that's being constructed here. What we did in the paper with my student, uh, <coughs> Guy Gorin, is here's a protocol. 
In the first round, everyone sends Rafael their value in case they are in favor. In the second round, Rafael sends his sends an okay message to his F, F uh, friends. And if they all get it, then what they do in the third round is they're all quiet. So they're the silent choir. And oops. Oh, sorry. And then uh, if you hear nothing in the third round, you commit. What happens in this protocol is that uh, <coughs> you send the minimal number of messages, but instead of using roughly three n rounds of communication, we use only three rounds of communication. So this has been a bit quick, but the point was we analyzed exactly what knowledge you needed, and by satisfying exactly that, we could improve the, the time complexity significantly. So the conclusion is there's a formal connection, strong mathematical formal connection between knowledge and action. Knowledge can depend non-trivially on properties of the system. If you have failures and synchrony or whatever, it's not only sending messages directly. And by analyzing things using knowledge, you can obtain a new powerful tool uh, to get efficient solutions. Back to Joe. Well, <clears throat> Joe's the only person I know who could be a faculty member in a top university in mathematics, philosophy, economics, of course, computer science, both through computing, AI, you know, formal methods, and probably, I don't know, biology. Thanks, Joe, for your mentorship, leadership, inspiration, pioneering vision, and friendship during the last 40 years, and hoping and looking forward for many years to come. The next 40 years. The next.